Have you ever been mixing a record and you do a treatment on an element and it sounds good, but then you change the treatment and you try something else and it also sounds good? You're not sure which one to pick? I think that that happens a lot. Compression, delay, EQ, reverb, these are all tools. They're technical instruments that we use to get desired results, but what are the desired results? So my name is Matthew Weiss. I'm a multi-platinum recordist, mixer, and producer. And in my video, Mixing with Emotion, we discuss not the how, but the why we choose to do certain things. When we run into those situations where multiple treatments sound good, we get to decide which one is better based on the emotional effect that it creates. And that's what this is all about. In this video, we're going to go through our main characters of emotion, as well as certain textures to those emotions, and show how using different techniques can help get results that the end listener is going to gravitate to and attach to. Because at no point does the end listener ever think, wow, the use of that compression is so great. What they hear is, wow, the sadness that's in this song is so captivating. That's what makes me want to listen again. That's what makes me want to buy the song. <laughs> You know, back when I was starting off, I would find that I would sometimes be mixing against other engineers and sometimes other musicians, and I found something very interesting. When I was mixing records and being compared to other engineers, frequently I was coming out ahead. People were picking my mixes over whoever else was mixing, which made me feel pretty good. But when I was mixing against musicians who didn't necessarily know how to engineer even, I found that people were picking their mixes over mine, and I would hear their mixes, and I would understand, but I wouldn't understand, because I would listen and I would say, well, my mix sounds clearer and fuller and punchier and bigger, so why is my mix not getting picked? And at first, I thought it was because the clients didn't really understand what made a good mix, and then I realized that's correct. Clients don't understand, listeners don't understand what makes a good mix, and they don't have to. What they have to do is be inspired by what they hear. They have to connect with it on a visceral level and on an emotional level. And so the musicians who were practiced on instruments and understood what the music was trying to do, and understood how the music was supposed to feel emotionally, were connecting with the music and mixing toward that, because they didn't have a standard for clarity or a standard for punch. All they had was a standard for connectivity within the music, of filling out the idea of what the music was trying to communicate. And so while they weren't doing the technical stuff as well as I was, they were doing the emotional stuff better. And at the end of the day, that's actually what's going to win the hearts of the people who are listening. And so over the years, I've found that the more I can connect with the emotion of a song, the better I can mix. And in fact, that idea can translate directly into the choices that I have. So now, in my mind and the way that I conceive things, I set emotional descriptions. I, I set an idea of what the character of the song should be, of what the end listener should feel. And I mix toward that. And so anytime I'm making any decision, the better and better I get, the more and more I incorporate these beacons into my choices. And the better I can pull them off, the better my overall mix feels. Sometimes the sound is not as good, but the sound becomes more compelling. It becomes more emotive. And I'm connecting with the music in terms of what's actually selling the song, what's actually presenting the emotion. So I'm going to give you an example of that and some choices that might happen if we have these beacons here. So I'm going to play a little intro to the song that I mixed recently. It goes like this. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. He's passed, but his lessons are always going to be with me. My name is Cloud, soldier first class. My best friend, Zach, before he passed, he asked me for one thing. So this is just narrative dialogue as an intro. Typically with narrative dialogue, all you want to do is make the voice sound as much like the natural voice as possible, maybe with a hint of sweetening, but maybe not. 
So first of all, in a lot of narration, actually for voiceover, this sounds pretty good. However, being that I feel I can make things sound cleaner, clearer, and better, I'm going to apply some EQ and a little bit of compression to kind of glue everything together, make all the levels even. And here would be a very traditional approach to saying, okay, this is supposed to sound like narrative. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. He's passed, but his lessons are always gonna be with me. My name was Cloud, soldier first class. My best friend, Zach, before he passed. Right, so that sounds like really good narration. It's maybe like just a little bit sparklier than we would normally hear dialogue, but that's okay, it's music, and I like that choice in general. That said, is it playing to the emotion of the song? Is it playing to the theme of the album? And the answer to that is, well, it's not taking away. I'm getting the job done for sure, but maybe there's something more I could do here. First of all, dry narration in the context of music is not that interesting. So right away, I'm sort of thinking maybe there could be a more creative approach to that. Second of all, this entire album is dedicated to a video game called Final Fantasy VII, which has very strong sci-fi feels to it. And so I'm thinking maybe I can make it sound a little science fiction-y. And on top of that, this is presented as narration of nostalgia. So I kind of want to make the vocal embrace that nostalgic energy. So that last concept right there sort of inspired me to say, hey, maybe I can bust the vocal out to my cassette deck and give it a little bit of grunge. I can make it sort of like a lo-fied kind of thing that feels very old, but at the same time has sort of a sciencey, techy, like almost steampunk kind of feel to it. You know, I, I li a lot of times I like to think of like the Johnny Mnemonic style of sci-fi where it's like futuristic but also junky at the same time. It's a very cool flavor. So when I do that, I end up getting this. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. He's passed, but his lessons are always going to be with me. My name is Cloud, soldier first class. So already we have a texture, we have something interesting, we have something that kind of feels now like it's nostalgic a little bit. It's starting to go in that direction. The other thing is because this is looking back on something, I kind of compare that to like a dream state when you go into memory. So usually when we're doing that, I don't want the level to be too loud. I don't mind if it's a little bit further back and a little bit more buried within the music. So I'm gonna turn the level down just as my next move. To be a hero? You need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. So now what I want to do is make it feel a little bit more um, sci-fi, a little bit more like it's being spoken through like an intercom helmet of, of somebody who's in space or something like that. So in order to do that, I'm going to do a little bit of EQ where I take out some of the low end and I take out some of the extra high end that would not be there. A lot of the times with intercoms and phones and things like that, the very top of the frequency range is chopped off and the frequency range right before that is actually boosted for clarity purposes. That's sort of why everything has that kind of phone effect whenever we're hearing it through something like an intercom helmet or a telephone or a cell phone or something like that. We lose the lows and the highs, but we gain a little bit of uh, clarity as well. So I'm actually doing that through two EQs here. I'm doing a boost on uh, the second EQ and I'm doing some cuts on this first EQ and the cuts I'm using the stock Pro Tools EQ because I don't want the best sounding EQ in the world. It's not a bad sounding EQ. I actually wish I had something that sounded worse, but I couldn't think of anything right off the top of my head. Uh, but I want to have all of the negative artifacts that come from EQing something because I don't want this to sound too good. I actually want it to sound as junky as possible. And then the other thing that I'm doing is I'm using this uh, PSPB scanner to create a little bit of modulation, which is going to create some weird little quirky artifacts. And that's also going to make it feel a little surreal and a little bit like we're looking into a dream. It's pretty subtle, but I'll, I'll play the before and then I'll play the after. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. And so you hear that little bit of modulation as well in there. Here's just the EQ. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. 
right? We got the space station helmet effect. We did that. Now let's add in the modulation. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. And now it feels a little bit surreal and unearthly. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. And then lastly, I really want to embrace this idea of being in this like vacuous space. So I want a reverb, but I want a reverb that's extremely far away and weird and quirky. I don't want a typical reverb that's going to make things sound pretty and lush. A lot of the times we want that, but here we want something that makes it feel like we're in the vacuum of space. And I have a perfect reverb for that. It's the Eventide Black Hole. And for this, you know, I can design my own sounds with this for sure if I have something extremely specific in mind. Mind. But in this particular case, I didn't have something extremely specific. I just knew I wanted it to feel like the vacuum of space. So I went through a number of presets and I landed on this one, which just absolutely did it for me. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. He's passed, but his lessons are always going to be with me. So now, let's go to the just... This is narration, how do I treat narration? Make it sound as good as possible, let's go. And then I'm gonna compare that to, here's an idea to create an evocation of emotion. Something that's going to feel nostalgic, futuristic, but kind of junky and lonely that complements what the mood of the strings are doing. So here's our narration. To be a hero, you need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. He's passed, but to be a hero, you need to have dreams. That's what my friend told me. He's passed, but his lessons are always going to be with me. So there's a number of things that are important to point out. First of all, in terms of how the vocal sounds, just in terms of its body, its presence, its size, the traditional narration approach is clearly a more natural sound, a more compelling sound in terms of representing the actual voice itself and in terms of sounding bigger. However, when it comes to the interest and the emotion and the captivation of it, I, I don't think it's even a contest that the weird lo-fi junky one, even though it doesn't sound nearly as big and nearly as clear, it actually sounds a lot better because it's playing right into the intention here. And the big difference, the big beacon is that I'm captivated by it. There's something about it where now it's not just the voice itself and what's being said that's catching my ear, but it's also the sonic quality of it that's bringing me in and making me want to hear more. Which which is really important because this intro, it's an intro. It needs to pull me into the next section. I think for every other emotion, we can have artifice and it's okay. But I think for sadness, it tends to take away more than it gives. Anytime we start doing heavy-handed processing, it's very, very easy to start creating a sense of something being processed, which creates a sense of something being artificial. So we have to be very wary of the processing we're doing. And you'll notice that there's no reverb on this, and that's a choice. I could certainly put in a reverb to sweeten the sound, but the way that I'm picturing this section is it's almost like somebody telling a story around a campfire or, uh, you know, telling, telling the kids a story. Sit down, kids, I'm going to tell you a story. And so for that, maybe if I did a reverb, it would be like a small room because it would capture that feeling of being in like, you know, like a little family gathering where it's like, okay, grandkids, let me tell you this story. You help me. 